Good evening, everyone. Now, the chair said I could go with ditto, so I'm going to go with ditto. It is my distinct pleasure to have the honor of introducing tonight's guest speaker, Professor Antonio Andreoni. Antonio Andreoni is Professor of Development Economics at the Department of Economics of SOAS, University of London. He is also a visiting professor at the South African Research Chair in Industrial Development, University of Johannesburg, and Honorary Professor at the Institute for Innovation and Public Purpose, University College, London. He has published extensively and edited volumes on technological change and digitalization, structural transformation, political economy of development, industrial policy and competition policy. His research has been published in several distinguished journals, including the Cambridge Journal of Economics, Structural Change and Economic Dynamics, Technovation, Oxford Review of Economic Policy, Development and Change, Energy Policy, Cambridge Journal of Regions, and the list goes on and on and on. His latest books include Structural Transformation in South Africa and From Financialization to Innovation. Antonio is a co-editor of European Journal of Development Research. For over a decade, he has provided advice on industrial policymaking to several organizations such as UNIDO, UNCTAD, ILO, UNDP, the World Bank, the OECD, and national governments. Now, if I were to list all of his accomplishments, it would take all evening, so I think I'm gonna stop here. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, please help me welcome our esteemed guest speaker, Professor Antonio Andreoni. Yes. So it seems that Dito is the word of the evening, so I'll say Dito. Uh, but I would like to say that I'm extremely, extremely pleased uh, to have uh, the opportunity and the honor to have the opportunity to give this lecture tonight. Um, the last two, three days, we've been uh, having a number of already of engagement, which really convinced me of how uh, vibrant is the discussion at the moment, and how uh, I understand brought from the policy side, business, academia, there is lots of eagerness in engaging with these issues. And I hope I can contribute in this discussion tonight. Um, and in a sense, I picked up this topic um, because not, it's not simply part of my uh, research work and so on, but also because it's something that in many places where I have the pleasure to work, um, this is something that always comes up. Um, partially because there are lots of countries who are facing the kind of challenges and issues that you uh, pointed out uh, in your initial remarks. And so in a sense, the idea of focusing on how to escape this middle income, middle income technology trap, and I'll explain why we talk about a technology trap, uh, is a way of uh, talking to uh, the audience here, but generally talking to all those countries who are actually struggling uh, for various reasons, both domestically and internationally, in a specific historical phase where uh, industrialization and structural transformation is still essential, not just from an economic point of view, but also from a social, political economy point of view, in terms of transforming society, creating more inclusive, sustainable society. Um, and in a sense, uh, still is something that countries are struggling to achieve in many respects. So my uh, title suggests that I will try to engage with what we know about why this is so difficult, why we are seeing so many countries trying to escape this trap and still uh, not succeeding. Um, what are the drivers? What are the mechanisms that are at place? And I will try to use some example. Um, I will not go too heavy on uh, uh, you know, the academic side of the discussion. I'm sure we can uh, engage uh, in other moments on that. But I would like to show you some piece of evidence which start uh, suggesting also in what direction we 
we, we are supposed to, to start looking at and focus our attention, not just from a research point of view, but even more importantly, from a policy point of view. And this is why, towards the end of my discussion, effectively throughout all of it, I will try to also uh, bring some ideas around industrial policy. And uh, as we know, industrial policy for many years has been a sort of taboo word or a word you don't use with uh, the, the right people and uh, you know, in, a, in a polite environment, you don't use this expression. But effectively, we have been seeing a dramatic shift uh, in, across the world. In a sense, the king is naked. Everyone has always been doing industrial policy. Uh, everyone is rediscovering and using industrial policy in a dramatic way. And frankly, uh, just to be provocative here, there is no country which has been able to industrialize without industrial policy. So in a sense, we moved away from a quite unproductive discussion, confrontation around uh, quite standard ways of looking at these issues, pro-market, pro-state, state against the market. And we have started realizing that effectively, especially at this moment in time, we really need to have a very uh, uh, coordinated approach to face the kind of major challenges that economies are facing. And I think the pandemic, the recent pandemic, has been uh, an eye opener for many people in terms of understanding how many problems there were in the model that was proposed as the model for developing, for uh, uh, guaranteeing society's well-being and, and, and so on. Now, I'll try to... Um, in my presentation to mainly focus on these three first point and then open up towards the end some reflection also in terms of uh, how to look industrial policy not simply from the point of view of a one policy that one ministry is doing but actually as a policy that requires a joined up approach uh, i would uh, even uh, say that industrial policy ultimately is a core probably the core foundation for rethinking a social contract in a society because industrial policy ultimately is not simply trying to create more value in economic terms, but is also trying to create the foundations for a society which is more inclusive, that offer more social mobility, more opportunities, and that's the real conditions for being sustainable uh, uh, over time. So I will start with a few remarks around why people about, are talking about middle income trap. I've been doing it for quite some time and how we've been approaching in our research, in our work, this uh, uh, idea to try to go deeper in understanding what are the drivers, the mechanisms behind that. Let me start with uh, where this expression even came from. The World Bank a few years back was looking at the experience from the 60s up to the uh, early 2000, or mid 2000, and realized that there was a striking pattern there. Very few countries had managed over this period of time to actually catch up in terms of income, in terms of moving along, if you want, the income ladder internationally. And they started using this expression that, that was referring to a potential trap. Was the, what they were referring to was what you see in this chart. That basically very few countries were actually able to move along the uh, 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 ladder and remain at that point of high income status for quite some time. We have seen some countries moving up and down, but very few managed to actually fully transform their economies and create the condition to remain an high income economy or even to remain an upper income economy. There are a few economies probably comparable as well that are close to uh, Jamaica discussion, if I think about countries like Mauritius or Costa Rica and others, who sort of managed to almost touch if Mauritius at some point reached the point of high income. But clearly, to sustain that kind of status, it's not just a matter of an episode, it's a matter of more fundamental structural transformation. And this is what is so challenging in many, in many countries. Now, people have been looking at different explanations of that. Um, and all this explanation, I try to sum them up in uh, uh, these three points. I hope you can see the last part of the slide. Maybe if we uh, work on the, on the slides to move a bit up the reading, there is going to be some material, otherwise you cannot see. But fundamentally, people have been raising a general argument. Uh, Professor Justin Lee, the former chief economist of the World Bank, has talked about a uh, basically problem around productivity. Right? The fact that fundamentally increasing productivity is extremely difficult 
Uh, because productivity is not just about, of course it's about skilled people, but it's about organizations. It's about organizations that know how to use and deploy skilled labor and R&D and technologies in a way that actually deliver the kind of uh, uh, productivity growth that high income economies experience. The second argument that has been put forward is fundamentally countries who are trying to move, before you were mentioning Malaysia, Thailand, all these countries, they could leverage up to a certain point their competitive advantage in terms of wages, but then at some point they had to start again moving up in terms of their specialization and wage competitiveness was not sufficient anymore. And when they were trying to do that, they were facing other barriers. They had to com compete themselves with countries which had mastered the art of producing at scale. Scale is still a major determinant of competitiveness across the board. And we know that among those countries who managed to jump up in the high income status, not just China, but you know, Korea and so on, the Taiwan and so on, we have countries which have managed to build up corporations and companies which get operate at a scale which is comparable to the scale of uh, entire countries. I'll show you later some uh, simple information around data around export basket and so on. And when I look at the export basket or the uh, output industrial up or certain countries, the scale of that is comparable to one or two companies in some of these countries. It is important to keep this in mind. Now, countries who have been trying to move towards uh, upgrading their technologies, they faced a remain squeezed between not being able anymore to use their low wages because they needed more skilled people, but at the same time, they couldn't have that mastering of technology scale that the other country had. So they remain stuck in that situation. I was just in Thailand three weeks ago, and the big discussion at the moment is we have been very successful in developing the automotive sector. Of course, Toyota was the major player there. We have an entire supply chain, but we are not the country where major investment in electric vehicles is happening. And of course, they're looking at their neighbor, Vietnam, and of course, China, and so on. So countries that are in this process, even the successful one to a certain extent, are constantly fighting this space into the upper or uh, high income status. And ultimately there are political economy issues. Industrialization, as I said, is not just an economic issue. We know very well, businesses, government, we know very well that is basically changing the way in which the political economy, the distribution of power, interest, change over time, with opening up of the society, having more uh, center of interest, of influence, and finding new ways of coordinating that. So countries which have managed to escape, those very few are those who have also managed to, with lots of trouble, uh, but have managed to find better ways of coordinating this different political economy issues. And this is an important aspect to keep in mind. Now, all these theories are very helpful, but when it comes to design industrial policy, often we are sort of facing the problem of saying, okay, where do I start here, right? These are all issues that matter, but what is the, the key structural issues, the key institutional aspects that we need to keep in mind before someone mentioned the education system? Uh, these days we've been discussing around how difficult it is to uh, uh, supply or build up supply chain in a domestic context where scale is very limited or where capacity is not existing across especially small uh, and micro enterprises. So we try to build up an understanding, a more detailed understanding of the specific dynamics that are playing this uh, a, a role in terms of creating this trap and we developed this idea with colleagues across different countries of a middle income technology trap. Because ultimately, as we were discussing the other day as well in another of these four events, ultimately lots of the transformation we would like to see are driven by deploying technologies across not just manufacturing activities, but across many sectors in the society. I would even argue that effectively today you can have a very advanced agricultural sector to the extent that you do things as you do it in a manufacturing sector using manufacturing technologies, using digital solution, and so on. Similar in services. So in effect, we know that lots of these sectoral boundaries have been blurring, and now we can actually start exploring opportunity across the board. 
Now, in this work that we did with, again, with some colleagues, what we tried to do was actually say, okay, if you start looking at the most recent experience of countries we've been stuck in the current global setting, what are the factors, what are the main challenges that they're facing? And we came out with this uh, sort of way of uh, analytically uh, identify four main dynamics at play. Well, the first one, it's a dynamic that we call of breaking into. If I give you this number, over the last few years, we've been tracking with lots of the organizations that were mentioned, we need and others, benchmarking countries and looking at how things were evolving globally. And you would be shocked to see that only 20 countries capture basically 85, 90% of the, all the manufacturing value addition in the world. And they are always the same countries. And in fact, over the years, we've been seeing increasing concentration in a number of sectors, which ultimately make it very difficult for new companies to enter into that space. And because the companies that are in any of these sectors are of strong national interest, these companies are also backed up by governments, are backed up by broader institutional setting. So the big, big first challenge we focused on is how you break into. And as, as we know, that has been already mentioned in some of the articles as well that have been written recently by Don and others. Well, lots of countries, middle-income countries, have been trying to break into by linking up into global value chain. And effectively, this has been the last 20 years mantra. If you're especially a small economy, forget about building lots of activities. Just try to find some small niches here and there to link up. Doesn't matter if it is in garments, if it is the maquiladoras in Mexico, or if it is whatever other sector. But that is the only way for you to uh, gain your space into the, uh, 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 those sectors that are so important to uh, sustain productivity growth. And guess what? We have seen that lots of countries have tried, but the results have been quite mixed. And effectively, when we look back, I'll show you some charts that hopefully will give you the signs of that. When we look at the experience of the country in the past, especially the station miracle countries, who managed actually to use GVC integration, linking up in an effective way, these countries were not simply integrating and learning how to export, but also were linking back, meaning they were finding ways to build up local supply chains that increasingly were replacing lots of the imports and innovating in terms of technology, in terms of markets. I was uh, uh, just last week actually in South Africa and we were discussing how across Africa you find lots of Chinese technologies. And as has been uh, colleagues from MIT have defined them, these are technologies at Jap of Japanese quality with a Chinese price. What that means, means that they've been able to reverse engineer lots of machinery, pumps for increasing productivity in agriculture or reducing the functionality of some machine. We don't use lots of things in these phones or cars or whatever. And generating good enough products that are innovative and penetrate markets in these regions where there is demand for these activities. So the linking back is not simply trying to build up supply chain by doing it in innovative ways. Finding new ways to add value basically to what you're good at doing. And what you're good at doing is not necessarily the new fancy things, could be a very basic product, but has the quality characteristic market segments that uh, deliver quality and, and value addition. So ultimately, this kind of process has to be backed up by a not simply creating domestic capacity, but also keeping up with technological change. And this is a very difficult exercise to do. I'll show you something later. Because while you try to keep up, the technology keeps going. This is what people call the Red Queen effect. If you think about Alice in the Wonderland, right, that's what the story is about, right? You, even if you speed up, if the frontier is moving far faster than you, you are actually are still behind and actually falling behind. Let me show you some data around what I just said. This is the convergence that you see in terms of, at the global level, the top uh, industrializer, you get the G7 companies, and then you get the other top 16 economies who make the big part of manufacturing value addition. And there has been convergence, meaning that the global south, so to speak, has been able to, building up 
industrial capacity, manufacturing value addition share of the economies that have been industrializing has been increasing. And these are all the companies that, sorry, countries that effectively have moved very close to the upper middle income status, the Thailand, Malaysia, Indonesia, the kind of countries we've mentioned before. The problem is that there are very few countries who have been doing that, and there is one country which has been doing it much better than anyone else. And not just in terms of quantum, but in terms of speed. That first chart on the, which project China here, shows you that China basically since 1995, every five years has been able to gain 5% of world manufacturing value added share. It's like in business, you have a competitor who are in 10 years taking over you know, 10, 15, 20% of the market. And while this was happening, in many other parts of the world, we were seeing that countries which were trying to engage with this new complex kind of landscape, more than gaining some value addition, I'm sorry if you cannot, these are all other countries which have been uh, sort of gaining uh, manufacturing value added share. Poland, Turkey, to a certain extent Brazil in a more discontinuous way. All the other countries which are not there, normally what they've been experiencing has been the opposite. Instead of gaining va value added shares, instead of becoming in the quality and quantity of manufacturing activities and broader uh, productivity increase better, they've actually been deindustrializing. And in many cases, they've been doing that much earlier than we would have expected, given their income. All countries tend to have, when you take an aggregate picture, a contribution of manufacturing sort of following an inverted U shape, right? You, uh, early stages of industrialization, you have lots of manufacturing activities, and then vis-a-vis -vis the rest of the economy, the shares reduce. The absolute value doesn't reduce, the absolute value keeps growing, but because other services and other sectors benefit so much from economies of scale and productivity increase in manufacturing, on the accounting side, on the macro side, they look like they matter much more. But all the economies that lose that critical mass, suddenly lose also their capacity to be innovative and building capacity with the other sector. Now, that story, that inverted U story, is the one that you see there, that basically it says the more you increase your value addition, thanks so much, the more you increase your, is this working? Yeah. The more you increase your income, the more you increase your income, the more you expect that you're going to lose some share of manufacturing. But what is happening now is that many countries are actually below this line, the blue one, meaning at very early stages of their GDP per capita, they start seeing their manufacturing value addition and their share going down dramatically. And this is very problematic because fundamentally, if we talk about escaping a trap, and we know that certain sectors have a much more scope for uh, increasing productivity and value addition, if you don't have capacity in this sector building up, you are basically unable to make the overall economy basically experiencing this broader increasing returns. Premature deindustrialization, a pre-industrial premature deindustrialization is a major phenomenon across economies like Jamaica that are more below the upper middle income, those that we were mentioning before that already managed in the 80s, 90s to actually benefit from manufacturing value addition. Uh, we've done lots of econometric work to try to map out how these different countries work and how they are in terms of their dynamic, are they accelerating, decelerating? Are they falling behind, are they catching up? Now, all this phenomenon, you saw most of the data show you track basically the 90s up to the financial crisis, and we'll see more updated data later. Many of the countries who have been trying to escape their middle income trap at that point in time, they were doing it at the time where fundamentally we were seeing the rise of global value chain and regional value chain. Let me be very clear, there is nothing new about value chains. In the first industrial revolution, there was a putting out system which was a, you know, a small scale of value chains, right? Production has always been organized in that way. But the scale at which this was made possible by the ICT revolution, by uh, opening up of trade, by several dynamics in the global economy, 
have made these value chains becoming absolutely dominant in terms of the global organization of industry and structure. And also they've been become the main link between countries in many respects. Because it's not simply a matter of trading goods, it's a matter of organizing production across different countries. And when you organize production across different countries, large companies who are making FDI investment or engaging with an economy ultimately do not have suppliers as the interlocutor. We had to have their, the government from that country, institution in that country, and so on and so forth. Now, most of these activities, again, these value chains, and there are scholars also from Latin America who have contributed dramatically, who have worked in Latin America to, and Caribbean to study the evolution of GDC. We are discussing with uh, Denzil, Gary Jereffi, and other scholars who actually build up their first understanding of this value chain through commodity chains and other type of structures. They've always pointed out that this was a model that existed for a long time, that would open some opportunities, but also could create lots of traps themselves. What are those traps? Well, first of all, before we get into them, let's unpack how, what were the drivers of some of this emergence of GDC. Well, first of all, uh, lead firm strategies were looking for locations where to find cheap labor to a certain extent, but also where to find new markets, and in fact, restrict competition in these markets, avoiding that in these countries, new companies, potential competitors could rise. More critically, they have perfectioned the art of organizing supply chain around the world. They build up their own global alliances. So when government in many countries are working, say, we want to do our local content, I always tell them, well, there is someone who is already doing localization policy for you. These are the international companies who have already decided before even they come to your country where they're going to supply each of the single components up to the very small components from their own global chain. And of course, governments have contributed to the development of this because there has been a massive opening up of international trade and a massive liberalization. In some countries, more strategic, in other, uh, quite, uh, if you want, uh, non-strategic or uh, without too much thinking, countries suddenly have been uh, flooded with uh, the opportunities to import uh, and to be linked to some of this value chain. Now, the nature of these linkages is what matter. Because you can actually benefit a lot from this connection, or you can be actually in a much uh, worse position as a result of not having a strategic industrial policy approach towards them. Now, those who think that we can benefit a lot have put up this argument. They've been saying, look, you link up. You don't need to build up new verticals. You don't need to build up an entire industrial sector. You just need to be able to have few activities in place. And in fact, the OECD has gone as far as saying, the more you import, the more you will export. And to a certain extent, there is some element of truth in some of these arguments. But the question is, are these phenomena that we observe, the input of the output, meaning, when you are importing more because you are exporting more, is, is something that starts at the very beginning of your process of industrialization, or is something that you start seeing later on, where actually you have managed to industrialize and you are a competitor in the global economy? There are lots of other problems, of course, because specializing in specific niches of the market can also limit your capacity to diversify and being independent in your decisions in terms of what you want to invest on, what products to, uh, what brands, what domestic companies you want to develop. Ultimately, lots of this counter argument comes from and starts from the idea that GVC and linking up into GVC opens opportunities, but you are not operating in a space where everyone has the same power. Power along value chains is very unequally distributed. It's very asymmetric. And this means that when local companies or governments are trying to negotiate with international companies, they have to face lots of very hard negotiations. And these hard negotiations really affect the extent to which you can actually have an industrial strategy to start with, or you are going to be, let me see, you are going to be um, able to create uh, alliances between domestic and international companies. 
Now, these kind of power asymmetries are complex to understand. It's not always the big players internationally. There can be lots of intermediate players. Lots of traders, for example, that intermediate the relationship between the international companies and the domestic company. So ultimately, what you find is that the value that is created, it's not distributed along the chain according to your contribution. It's more distributed according to how much power you have to actually extract these chains. And these chains are all different. We work on garments, automotive, pharma, medical device. They all operate in very different ways. And without understanding where you are, where companies can locate themselves, and what kind of power relationship they are going to have with international players or domestic players that mediate that relationship, of course, we are far from understanding you know, who is actually benefiting for all this GVC integration, this linking up. Of course, power is not just power along the value chain, it's power also in the domestic economy. And I want to make this point clear because sometimes there is a sort of narrative, right, which seems to say all the problem is all what is happening globally, as if domestically there are no major political economy issues. Power distribution at the local level and how that is structured, reorganized through industrial policy and through relationship between businesses and government through different type of coalitions of interest is essential to lock productive opportunities. Governments, by definition, through regulation, through allocating licenses, whatever they do, or through giving direct money, they're allocating rents. They're allocating opportunities of resources that can be used in different ways, in a productive way or unproductive way. And depending on how they are uh, monitored, how the carrot stick game works, you can have very different outcomes. No governments in the world has been able to always do it right. So think like, let's forget about the idea that government can fail. Of course, government can fail. Business can fail as well. That's the nature of industrialization. There are lots of uncertainties. There are lots of complex dynamics that you're managing. So failure is part of the exercise. There is no country. If you look at South Korea in the very beginning, they were making one failure after the other. And they were having the worst, worst type of institution in place. Koreans were, at that time, in the 60s, were poorer than many African countries, and they were trying to get their government trained in Pakistan, which clearly, if you think ex post, <laughs> is quite a paradox, right? Where Pakistan is here now and where South Korea is. So here, this is not a story of simple solutions. It's not a story of uh, simply solving the technical problem I just described. It's also a political economy problem. Now, if we look at what has been happening, is that GVC has uh, been meeting Latin America, but as you can see from the chart there, the integration into the value chains has been mainly driven by basically buying in more things, and the amount of things that are exported have a quite limited domestic value addition. Means that fundamentally, you are linking up, but you are not linking back meaning you are not developing sufficient capacity which is able to contribute to value addition. I'll give you a very simple example. Malaysia, when started entering into the electronics industry, was importing 80-90% of the components. After 15 years, the ratio changed the other way around. The domestic value addition was 80-90% of the final products that we're exporting. So that kind of dynamic is central to this kind of industrialization process, this transformation of the productive base. Now, if we look at countries like Jamaica and we compare it with countries like, for example, Costa Rica, a neighbor here, and we look at export basket, and we can do that for many years, I don't have time now to go into all the details, but the point is that you realize how that integration into value chains has not delivered any change fundamentally into the capacity to exporting different type of goods and adding value to these goods. In the case of Costa Rica, the picture, that's why I put it in contrast, is dramatically different and is different for, in particular, one key manufacturing sector, which is medical device, which took good 20 plus years to develop. But as a result of that development, look how different it is. 
the export basket of Jamaica vis-a-vis -vis Costa Rica. I could put there Mauritius, I could put there many different comparators. I'm saying this because it's important to realize that it's not impossible. There are countries who are doing that linking back. There are lots of countries who have tried and have not succeed, but that doesn't mean that actually there is a shortcut that you can avoid. And of course, by developing this industry, you also can see that Costa Rica has started importing on components, products, uh, all sorts of things that are used in medical device, but they are able to export much more of what they are importing. So their contribution in value addition for the country through that sector has transformed basically their uh, balance of trade. This is the story also of countries like Korea, like China and so on. I don't have time to go into the detail, but that to show that the normal pattern that we observe in all countries who manage to escape the middle income trap or manage at least to diversify their economy and position themselves in a, in a sort of structure of the economy which has the potential to escape the trap are all economies which have done this dance. They've been, they've been linking up, they've gone into the global economy knowing that they needed to link back, that they have strategically engaged what Kulin calls in, out, in, and then when they are capable to go back in the global economy with their own products, with their own OEMs and so on, they were actually going back again out. So this is not an argument around, I do import substitution, everything will work. It's not an argument, I do export promotion and everything is going to work. It's the strategic engagement at different moment of the development process with these two dynamics that give result. This is the case of China, it's the most striking one, right? You can see the curve there, which goes up in terms of the amount of integration into the value addition that was coming from importing more goods, and then the domestic value addition started kicking in, meaning they were selling things out which had lots of local domestic content, which added lots of value, lots of technology, lot technology lots of skilled capacity. In 2010, MIT was commissioned to do a study of what was happening uh, with China. It's not a new story, the competition we see today. In fact, MIT did the same study in the 80s when the US was concerned about Japan. They regularly have this kind of... And the last study was basically saying, well, the problem now is not so much that China is good with cheap labor or scale, is that lots of companies go there because they can find the supply chain that they need to develop their products and they cannot find it anymore in the US. And they went product by product looking at what they were not able anymore to produce. I don't mention the UK because the situation is even worse. <laughs> and it's even worse partially, I'll come back to that later, because we've been having lots of ideas around industrial policy, probably six in the last 10 years, <laughs> and no one of those have actually uh, managed to address a fundamental structural problem that the country has dramatically deindustrialized. Now, when we talk about keeping pace with technology today, lots of the keeping pace is about keeping pace with the change in the technological paradigm, which is digitalization. Digitalization is not just ICT. ICT has been with us for quite some time, including automation has been with us for a long time and robotization as well. So there is nothing dramatically new. There is something that is unique. It's the fact that lots of the digital technologies that we see apply to their cross sectors. In agriculture, if you use a drone and you have a tractor with automatic, uh, which is controlled by satellite with autonomous driving, that's a pretty much digitalized system. If you have a... Uh, uh, as it is happening in Costa Rica, you develop technology that can do surgery with a doctor which is somewhere else in uh, the US, in Germany, in UK, wherever it is, that is, is a proper digital uh, solution. So digitalization is basically integrating lots of realm of science and capabilities and bringing them together to basically transform the way in which we do lots of things, which we were doing already before, in a relatively more simple way. Now, digitalization, because integrate lots of things, require 
to train people in being able not just to do one thing, but actually to dominate, control different realm of science. Those who have been seeing, for example, in the 90s, the revolution that was coming with the integration of mechanical and electronic engineering, the so-called mechatronics, know that at that time we were talking about technology fusion, and now we have that at a much bigger scale. Because now it's not just mechanical, electronic, it's lots of advanced materials, blah, 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 lots of different things. Now, this creates a big challenge, because countries who are trying to engage with these technologies, they have at the same time to develop very specialized skills, while at the same time develop these basic skills that unfortunately they don't have yet in the population, simply because they never industrialized. So you have very lots of trade-off there in the engagement with new technologies. And lots of the trade-off also come from the fact that lots of the investment we are talking about here are of a very large scale. All governments or countries I work with, they have budget for R&D, innovation, and so on. But normally it's very small in comparison to the ch challenge that many of these technology present in terms of not only getting new R&D ideas, but also scaling up these technologies, meaning going through all the stages of development of a technology, which goes from the R&D to the prototyping, testing, testing the manufacturability of that, and so on and so forth. And normally, many governments just put their emphasis on one side, which is the traditional R&D, but don't actually look at that intermediate steps where investment normally don't go, because there is lots of uncertainty. If someone from university says, I have a very good idea about how to do this new piece of uh, kit or equipment or whatever, before that is something that a company would pick up, has to be going through lots of de further development. And the company is not necessarily keen to invest in doing all that scaling up. They are more interested in picking up the technology when it's mature enough that they can actually commercialize and gain out of that. So there is a gap there. And the gap, of course, is even bigger because you have not only uh, a big gap in between, but also the level of investment upstream and downstream the technology development, it's relatively limited compared to the kind of investment that are required in the space of digital technologies. Now, as already said, industrial policy has always been about engaging with these complex matters, even before GVC. I spend my time in discussing how the linking up, the linking back, the breaking into, the keeping pace with technologies are complex dynamic that are all interdependent and make very difficult to escape from that trap. But fundamentally, many of these problems were always the bread and, the bread and butter of industrial policy in different contexts with different kind of global scenarios and so on. If you think about, we all know the East Asian miracle since the Japanese government asked the World Bank to redo the report where Actually, the story was that Japan has managed to develop with simply market uh, opening up, and Japan said, well, maybe the story is a bit different. Um, since then, and then after the financial crisis, and then again, historically, over and over again, we see today in the US a big discussion on the IRA, on the New Frontiers Act, not very original on the name, there was a Frontier Act before, <laughs> immediately after the Second World War, Historical industrial policy have been central to the dynamics of capitalism and the creation of markets, the shaping of markets and institutions that go with it. China, of course, is the big elephant in the room when we talk about industrial policy, but as I pointed out, these are all policies that advanced economies have been using over the years, and maybe as we sometimes make jokes with my friends, colleagues, we say, well, an industrial policy, very effective one, is to convince other countries that you don't need industrial policy. <laughs> now, industrial policy, because it's such a contentious issue, you can find hundreds of definitions. Let me just point out one main point of the debate, why it's so important, because I'm sure that in the back of your mind, anyone who has heard the word industrial policy has also heard the word picking winners which has created this anxiety of, you know, oh, it's, about pick, it's all about picking winners. Now, just to be clear, uh, industrial policy is not 
a, a, such a simple exercise. It's a much more complex issue. First of all, not picking winners, deciding to do not make any decision, is also a decision in itself. Someone else is going to make the decision. And because, guess what, we are not living in functioning markets, even functioning markets often have problems of over-concentration or more powerful group, you know, uh, skewing the dynamics of market competition. So making decisions is a responsibility that has to happen, which is a broader responsibility, especially in a small society, small economy. The decisions is not the decision of the government, it's the decision of the government and all the stakeholders that operate in that space. Also, when you are making any kind of decision, you make often very implicit decision. I was uh, back from South Africa. We were with the former uh, minister, Arkebi Okubai, who is also at SOAS now with us as a British Academy global professor. And he was a key player in Ethiopia in building up special economic zones. He was in the board on the Ethiopian Airlines and so on. Now think about it. If you are saying, I want to make an investment in infrastructure, if you decide to build the Ethiopian airline and to export uh, flowers and fresh fruit and coffee in a uh, market, you are making a very specific decision, which you cannot do if you build up a port. Well, so Ethiopia cannot do that, but that's a different story. The issue is that whatever decision you make, if it is an infrastructure or training electronic engineers or medical science engineers or chemical, these are all decisions you make. So uh, you are going to pick pathway of development in any case. And in fact, countries who are especially having small amount of resources, they need to make decisions. They cannot afford to have a very broad agenda, which fundamentally doesn't leverage what is possible, what is feasible in that country, and simply distribute resources without making decisions. Even today, the European Union, I work uh, as, a, as an advisor to the DG Grow in uh, the European Commission, even the European Union, which has been historically quite adverse to the idea of, of course, vertical policy or selective policy, is now looking at a number of interventions at the technology level that will automatically pick some winners. When in, a, in the UK there has been a discussion of supporting pharma, well, you have two big companies, <laughs> GlaxoSmithKline and AstraZeneca, and you know, if you want or not, they are key stakeholders there, right? It's not just talking about random companies. So the key issue here is moving beyond this stereotypical understanding of industrial policy and engaging really with what industrial policy can deliver and what can do. Instruments for addressing the challenges we've been discussing, there are plenty of them. There are plenty of them. We can discuss many issues to these days. We've been discussing in detail some of the issues related to how you finance skills, how you support the scaling up of the technology, how you use development banks, and so on and so forth. But the main difference across countries when you look at the uh, industrial policy instruments is not so much the list of instruments. I'm sure you have many of those that you find in mature industrial economies. The big difference is the extent to which they can be implemented and enforced in a specific political economy context. So the enforceability of main industrial policy should be the main concern and the first concern when we discuss industrial policy. More than thinking too much about how much speaking of technologies or sector activities in place, the problem should be how do we design policies that address the issues we have been discussing and that by design, we know we have good chances to be able to enforce them. This is the implementation and enforceability is not an exposed thought, should be an exante thought in any policy design, because this is the main difference in terms of an effective industrial policy. Also, this means that you end up crafting policies in a way that is quite detailed, means understanding really businesses, understanding what can be asked to domestic businesses and how to create this dynamic of conditionality and reciprocity, where you attach conditionality to things that businesses, but also government, are supposed to deliver. So it's not just a, a government business conditionality, it's also the other way around, and also B2B conditionality. Now, this is the, in a nutshell, what all this industrial policy discussion is about. Now, industrial policies are evolving. They are covering lots of new spaces. And it's expanding because 
in many of the areas, if you think about climate change, if you think about the pandemic and so on, these are all phenomena which has lots of uncertainty and require lots of coordination. And while big international companies can coordinate internally what they want to do, a country itself doesn't have a natural coordinator, just as the government and big companies that can coordinate and align a number of initiatives and activities. There are lots of new areas that are emerging because effectively industrial policy can play a role in areas that are essential, not just for increasing growth, but for example, having more resilience in the economy. I mentioned about Costa Rica and medical device, device before. Well, if you can think about what Brazil has done in building up now capacity, not just in scaling up capacity for the entire Latin American and Central Caribbean region in vaccine manufacturing, not simply using old technology, so to speak, so vectoral type of uh, antivirus, but actually moving into mRNA through industrial policy, through institutions like Fiocruz. This is an example of an industrial policy that requires large coordination and require you know, building up the sense of urgency in the society of we need to be able to respond to the next pandemic. Similarly, if we think about climate change, there is so many opportunities, especially in countries with extremely high uh, electricity bills, to actually engage now with the opportunities that renewables are really offering because the cost price is actually competitive at business, especially when you are in the space of 25, 30 cents uh, per unit, as I think is in the country. Now, many of these innovations, let's say increasing resilience in medical device, the health system, the health industry complex, doing things in green technologies, if you build up new wind technologies or you, you introduce more renewables or you try to reduce the emissions of uh, heavy energy intensive industries like cement and, and so on, all these things will require lots of digital technologies. This is how people think about digital technologies. We are at this stage of uh, what people call the fourth industrial revolution. Many countries are still, and this is not just Jamaica, are still actually in the second, third industrial revolution in many respects. There are pockets of digitalization happening here, but they are also quite hidden and potentially are not delivering the kind of out outcomes that you would like to see because digitalization also is a very demanding technologies. I already mentioned how you need specific kind of skills, but also you need to have a reliable and cheap enough energy systems and so on and so forth. We have been trying to measure these things. We have been trying to work across six different middle income countries to see what they're doing with digital technologies. And we have developed a quite sophisticated uh, a technique to do that. We've been interviewing over 3,000 companies across Thailand, Vietnam, South Africa, Argentina, Brazil, Ghana. And what we have come out with, I'll save you from how we have done it, but basically, what we have found in lots of most of these countries, which are also more advanced technologically than Jamaica, themselves are struggling a lot to engage. There are very few companies that are able to use these technologies. The difference is that the scale of this, right? So if Brazil has a certain number of, let's say, 2%, uh, 21% of companies that are using third, fourth industrial revolution technologies, that is sufficient critical mass of companies to drive the fusions of these technologies. In countries where there are literally two, three companies who are trying to experiment to use these things, that is not enough. There has to be some policy that actually work on the diffusions of the technology scenario where you have potentially long hanging fruits, right? If you think about export of I was in South Africa, as I said last week, we were visiting a blueberry factory, and the blueberry factory selling in Europe, how do they make money? Well, we like fresh blueberries, don't we? And to make them fresh when you produce them in, in South Africa and you sell them in Amsterdam, you need to build up a cold chain, and a cold chain that has proper tracking, packaging, digital solution that support that process. Lots of these technologies are themselves embedded into, into value chain. We have developed a classification at six-digit level 
anyone who uses trade data or works with custom know that we classify products at a very granular level, and we managed to identify 120, more or less, products that are digital. And we try to see who is producing them, who is trading them. And the bottom line of the story is that lots of this part of the world, in particular Latin America and uh, uh, the African continent, is nowhere in that, in that space. In fact, the value chains in digital are completely concentrating around the Far East, and in particular, very dense network of value chain that are around the core uh, pulling force, which is China. But it's not just China. There are few entrants, if you have time to go through that. You know, there are countries like Vietnam, for example, where managed to jump into this league of few countries who have this kind of import-export in the multi-billions level relationship. Of course, China is the giant because China has understood much earlier than other countries how to engage with digitalization, robotization, electric vehicles, and have done that in a very specific way, which is almost impossible to replicate, but it's, impossible to, but, but it's important to understand. They've actually reproduced lots of verticals in these industries. Today we discuss how China is not producing just lots of electric vehicles, but is controlling mid-range of value chains related to electric vehicles, meaning the processing of lithium to get the batteries in place, to get precursors down to the battery assembling line. And it's done that with very strong and fast policies. We've done a study looking at, for example, how they became not just the first country in using more robots, but the country which is now becoming the main hub of innovation robotization. A technology which is very complex, where Japan has been the leader over the last century, from the 70s onwards, where actually they managed, with industrial policy again, to get the leadership from the US. The story gets even more complicated, because when you have digital technology, digital value chains, lots of these things are not simply value chains, they are platform. Value chains and platform are highly integrated. And again, not just in manufacturing, but if you think about the tourist industry, and you think about how much it costs to a small hotel to be listed in one of the main platform, these are large chunks of the returns that these companies can make, right? So access to market and multi-sided markets is increasingly mediated by this platform. And this is why Lots of the discussion now in industrial policy is not simply about how to support creating business, but actually how to remove the amount of concentration of power and potential abuse of that power that result in basically companies linking up into value chains and platform through markets and not being able to get any value out of that. This is why we've been arguing for the importance of integrating competition and industrial policy because Competition policy are also in relatively small countries, can be very important in uh, unpacking cases of concentration which reduce along the chain the possibility to develop. If you, I work a lot in South Africa, what we've been seeing there is the competition, the competition commission has been really investigating lots of cases where you have, for example, an upstream industry, let's say steel or chemicals, which actually is making it impossible downstream to develop manufacturing and service activities. Or cases where new platform collects so much data, let's say in health sector, and they can segment the insurance market and actually provide extremely extra profit out of that, especially through private sector hospitals. Another big area which is clearly related, as I said, to digitalization, is the green transition. And the reason is that lots of the transition will happen not because we have few solar panels here and there or few wind technologies, it's because we transform the energy system. And to stabilize and make the energy system capable to deliver the right balance of reliability, quality of energy, and sustainability, you basically need to build new infrastructure that rely on that also means that digital technologies and broader technologies need to help us in reducing emissions, especially from those industries that contribute the most to emissions. 
I myself, when I started looking at these things, I was shocked to realize that three industries alone contribute to roughly 50% of all the industrial emission that come from manufacturing activities, industri industrial activities. Chemicals and plastic, steel and iron, aluminum and uh, cement. If we find a solution to these three sectors, 50% of all the emission that are in that uh, 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 orange line are basically out of the picture. And we have actually country now focusing very much on how to use green hydrogen integrated with renewable technology, if it has to be green, you need to have green energy behind that, to actually address these major challenges. And many of these issues, again, also in the space of green, can happen only if the policies are designed introducing conditionalities attached to that. We have seen during, for example, the pandemic that governments have been introducing conditionalities because they were saying, well, if you are having a federal scheme and we pay your s the salary of your workers, please don't do certain type of things that undermine investment, undermine the stability of the economy, and so on and so forth. Similarly, in the green space, there have been lots of cases of conditionality, not, not enough cases, but lots of companies across Europe, China, and so on, have received significant support conditional on their transition. Let, let me skip this one. So I move towards the, the end. Now, this two example related to areas in which industrial policies are moving. I talked about digitalization, I talked about digitalization in relation to sustainability, green transition, and so on. Immediately point out to the fact that industrial policy is increasingly becoming a very complex coordination exercise. Let me go back one second here. Lots of the work and discussion we're having in South Africa, for example, is about you have actually big energy intensive industries. If we want to solve the problem in these industries, we need to think about how by greening these industries, we are greening the entire supply chain that depends on them. No, now, if you are able to reduce emissions from chemicals, now you can produce green fertilizers or you can actually make your glass industry less CO2 intensive, which means you don't end up having this paradox that you export bottles of wines to Europe, but the bottles don't come from your country because the CO2 emission of that would not pass the regulations there. So think about how many elements are there, right? There is an energy policy, there is an industrial policy, there is an agriculture productivity policy, there is standardization, there is trade policy. And this is my point. The point is that often we've been thinking about industrial policy as one of the policy. There is a ministry there, unfortunately the minister had to leave, but it's something that is put on the side under one ministry, and of course that minister find difficult to mainstream the industrial policy across a sec several ministries, departments, institutions. And this is the first fallacy of the industrial policy in countries where it doesn't work. So industrial policy, it's really restructuring and transforming the productive base and with that the social fabric of the society. And if you don't understand that, we are not actually able to start engaging with the complexity of this kind of processes. This is just an example to say how many interdependencies there are there. I talked about also competition policy, energy, infrastructure, and so on and so forth. So a strategic approach to industrial policy means recognizing this need for coordination and developing government, multi-stakeholder institutions, context, which allows to engage with this problem in a coordinated manner. Let me finish with just one slide. Because before coming, I also had conversation with colleagues, friends here, and of course, many people have emphasized the importance of having macroeconomic stability. And in case of Jamaica, of course, macroeconomic stability has been central to the agenda. And I think from a certain point of view, with all the problems, you also don't want to live in an economy with hyperinflation and complete destruction. So the problem is finding the right balance between macroeconomic stability that doesn't generate uh, a dead economy and macroeconomic stability that is conducive to an environment that can, with industrial policy and other instruments, generate economic growth. I would e even end up saying that industrial policy is a macroeconomic policy. 
You don't have macroeconomic stability if your economy is not able to grow. Ultimately, the only sustainability of a uh, conscious, you know, responsible, whatever we want to call it, macroeconomic policy is to actually do industrial policy. And we see this happening now. If you think about the big discussion on inflation that is happening in Europe, in the US, people are realizing that inflation is just not a macroeconomic phenomenon. People are saying, well, we are realizing that actually there are specific sectors where there are bottlenecks, where there is concentration, where value chains are broken, where people are over extracting profits. And if we want to reduce inflation, we need to engage with these specific problems. Well, engaging with these specific problems is actually doing industrial policy. So I wanted to conclude with this point because in a sense, in a country which has done enormous effort to reach a level of stability, I think it's time to also think about how to use that massive effort to create the conditions through industrial policy, through a, an engagement with the kind of complex issues we have discussed, uh, started discussing tonight, to actually deliver more sustained, inclusive, and sustainable growth uh, for the future. So I'll stop there, and thanks again for this opportunity. Thank you, thank you, Professor. Another round of applause, please. I would like to invite, um, before we go into the question and answers, Stephanie um, to come forward and um, present a little token. Thank you very much, Prof. I'm going to invite uh, Dr. Henke, who is the University Director for the Sir Arthur Lewis Institute for Social and Economic Studies to come forward and lead us um, into a question and answer session because I'm sure um, you would love to engage uh, with Professor. So Professor Henke, please give him a hand, please. All right, good evening again. That was a Equitable good evening, uh, but I add the detail. Um, well, this is what I call a high value lecture. I don't know about you. And it's not just, yes, you can give him another hand. And it's not just because he finally was able to make his way up here and deliver his lecture. Uh, no, I think this was a very relevant uh, lecture that touched on a number, a huge number of issues that um, uh, of vital importance to a country like Jamaica, the rest of the Caribbean. And um, uh, it's now your turn, it's my task to uh, transition you from being attentive audience and listeners to uh, engaged and um, vibrant askers of questions that you may have or comments that you may want to give. Um, I, we have about 15 minutes time for this session, um, I, so I'm asking everybody in order to allow a variety of questions to be asked to um, try and be as short as possible. We have, I think, two microphones, one on each side. Uh, I will have to call, I will call um, uh, on the uh, hands that I'm seeing at the time, and uh, uh, we go one by one, and then we give an opportunity to uh, engage each question uh, individually, all right? So if you want to come back up, yeah. Do, do we have a, um, I see one hand there, and then we go to this side. I'm going to switch left and right, all right? Yes, sir. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Professor, you kind of just brushed aside that there are government failures and there are private business failures. They're fundamentally different. Mm. If I go into business and I fail, I lose everything and I go home. If I'm the government and I direct the economy in such a way that resources flow into an area that fails. And by the way, when I'm talking about failure here, industrial policy can address the supply side, not the demand side. What would have happened if Jamaica in 1970 had decided, let's go heavily into manufacturing typewriters? 
Uh, who could have seen that 10 years later the typewriters would have been obsolete? So, um, you know, that, that is a problem I found um, with, and I won't even get into the issue of, you know, the government capture and, and all of that. Uh, first of all, just one thing, industrial policy is not just supply side. Public procurement is a major instrument of industrial policy. Um, there are lots of other regulations that indirectly create demand or create conditions for the supply side to adjust. This is uh, pretty, uh, if you want, established. And in fact, I would argue uh, we, we should look carefully at procurement because the government can create better condition for supply side development by actually using procurement in a strategic way. And we see this happening everywhere, by the way. Uh, again, uh, I don't have time to, to go into the details, but without public procurement, a different mechanism of feeding tariff and so on, we would not have any capacity across Europe, for example, in wind and renewables. Um, so just, just an example. Now, the issues, of course, you know, all the actors are, I, I try to be provocative saying, of course, all actors in this exercise, which is transforming an economy, are fundamentally uh, prone to failure because that exercise, as I try to show, presents several type of challenges. Now the question is, moving beyond this dichotomic relationship where if the f a business fail is a social problem, it's not just a, the failure of that businessman. It's a major social problem, and if it is a large company, uh, has a systemic interest for the rest of the economy. Countries who have been deindustrializing are exactly expect, uh, experiencing that. When you start losing large companies, which actually pull demand across lower, large supply chain, if that company collapse, it's not the, the problem of that businessman. <laughs> the problem is, first of all, the company is a collective. It's not just one person. It's a number of people who are contributing value creation in that company. These people are part of the society in many cases. And so it's a, I would say in both cases, it's a major dramatic issue. I think the main controversial issue is more about the fact that many of the failures come from situations where the relationship between government and private sector, more than being relationship of what people call embedded autonomy or meaning I work very closely with the private sector, but I'm also autonomous from that, meaning I try to regulate and I try to avoid that some people receive resources, some others don't, and if someone receives resources and doesn't deliver, just keep running with it. Uh, that is a problem that you find across all policies. In industrial policies are more evident, so we are more sensitive about these issues. But you know, if the government doesn't uh, build up an educational system that actually reward certain type of activities, that actually uh, target, also is a failure, and is a failure for the private sector, is a failure for the society, is a failure for the government and the, and the people involved. I think, in a, especially in a small country like Jamaica, I think we need really to start thinking carefully about how these failures are not just one side of the failure and how coordination can happen. Of course, coordination happen where you build up coalitions of interest around specific goals that the society has a broadly recognized as something that this society wants to aspire to. I mean, let's not forget that lots of this country had, on the one hand, you know, people like to call inspirational leaders, right? If you read Lee Kuan Yew on Singapore or you read, you know, the different kind of figures that were, uh, you know, inspiring, you know, transformation in these small economies in some cases or larger economies. But ultimately, these were just leaders. Many of these ideas and these coalitions were built up within institutions. The institutions became the anchor to a commitment to do things over the years because these are transformations that will not happen because someone make an investment for two, three years or the government decide to put a document out for the next uh, campaign, right? So uh, some people make jokes saying, don't worry, the first 200 years are the difficult one, then everything goes fine, right? <laughs> the first 200 years. Right? So that's, that's the reality of this, this, this process. You know, I'm, you know, sometimes I use with my students, my own case, I'm Italian, I come from the south of Italy. Um, Italy was a, a sort of laboratory for the World Bank to understand the dual economy model, We're talking about Arthur Lewis. Uh, and you know, this is a country where industrial policy have created lots of the brand that today you recognize as brand of the made in Italy exported. And there were lots of mistakes there. There are lots of mistakes in many countries. Lots of sectors have been picked which didn't pick up and didn't deliver.
but there were also lots of cases where actually uh, conditions were created for a more symbiotic relationship between private, third sector, society, institutions, academia, governments, and so on. So I would be more positive about that, because if we just go back and list all the cases things didn't work out, I don't think we are uh, you know, giving a favor to ourselves in terms of looking forward in terms of what can be done now. But I completely take your point. It's, I always say we need to be practicing the pessimism of the reason and the optimism of the will. Thank you. The, the good thing is uh, the program says question and answer, but there's more than one, so we're going to the right side there. Sorry, this is that? Okay. All right, thank you for your very insightful lecture, Professor Andrioni. My question for you is this. You have established that industrial policies back across the world for both advanced and emerging economies how do you suggest emerging economies compete with advanced economies, given that these countries have greater access to resources for industrial policy, they have lead firms that can make the investments in technology, and they have built up comparative advantages over multiple years? So if you, if you look at simply in a static way, many countries are in a position of absolute disadvantage across the board. So if you start from that position, there is no hope we can go home and <laughs> you know, just say, okay, that there is nothing we can do. The reality is that lots of countries which were in a position of almost absolute disadvantage, again, why Korea should be a major producer of steel? Clearly doesn't have the resources. There's no comparative advantage into that. And by the way, when they started, it was a major government failure. So the problem is to how you start thinking about what is feasible? If someone says, oh, well, let's look at how to build up chips manufacturing here, someone could say, well, maybe you are uh, not ambitious, but you are simply completely out of the reality of the situation, right? If you showed, I showed you the uh, balance of trade of even Costa Rica, what, you know, the export was 60 billion, 16, one six. You know, investment in uh, new production line for uh, semi-millimeter chips manufacturing is 20, 30, 40 billion. Right? There are companies for making that investment. So there are certain areas where the barrier is too difficult to, and it's almost impossible to get. But there are lots of areas, and there are already areas, potentially also here, where you can find specific opportunities for actually adding value to products, uh, leveraging the domestic demand that is also international. This is a country where lots of people like to come uh, because it's a beautiful place. Um, and you have ways to actually engage with these opportunities if you start looking from an industrial policy perspective incrementally where there are the capabilities that exist, what kind of government target focus should be put in place to leverage these capabilities that are latent, that are there but not able to reach sufficient scale, move up, and you know, building from these things. I mean, think about the Costa Rica case I mentioned. Why Costa Rica should be a major exporter of medical device across Latin America at the moment. And you know, we've written about the story, and many people have looked at that. Gary has written early for many people. They've engaged strategically with how to develop their uh, value chains around that. And they've persistently supported that sector in different stages. And that has delivered that kind of outcome that was pretty evident from the charts I mentioned. So yes, there are major barriers. Yes, we need to be aware of those. But there are lots of opportunities as well. I talked about how digital technology makes things you know, require lots of capabilities, but also make things much simpler. Allows to increase value to lots of products. And some of them are not necessarily rocket science, meaning introducing sensors or having a better packaging technology and so on can actually be done. So I would, again, be uh, conscious about what we need to look at um, and probably moving beyond an idea that there is a simple solution at the top, and if only we go with that, everything will follow. But actually, if we start looking at, at the sector level, value chain level, where opportunities are, how they've been built up, we look at comparators, we test the feasibility of certain type of initiative. And here, of course, the business sector has lots of capacity and, and understanding. Then we, we, we are on a different path for uh, transforming the economy. By the way, similar things should be done for institutions. We have lots of discussion about skills development, education, 
uh, you know, there are lots of problems as well, of course, to address in, this, in these institutions, and we have to be open about, about them, um, as much as we are open about the limitations that we have in the broader economy. Thank you. I saw a hand there. Yeah. Good evening, everyone. Uh, Prof, you spoke about in the fourth industrial revolution, the big Asian giants, and even related to what the other person asked. I think these Asian giants like India and China even used the population, which, which could have seen as a negative in their, for their growth. But what pathway of development do you think can work in these small island states, you know, especially our proximity to the Northern American continent? And uh, what role can we in academia, you know, how can we put ourselves into action? What kind of research we can do to make sure that these pathway of development, because some of these pathways can go nowhere and there are resources and you had a, you had a slide where you had technologies and policies. And what I often find is that in, in government, they will have one, one dot of, you know, few policies in place, but there's nothing connecting the dots to show the whole process. So what, what can be done? What advice would you give? And what can academia do? Yeah. Okay, let me start with the last part. I think academic institution can play a very important role, but we need to uh, get out from the, from the class, uh, bringing with us students, and being humble enough to go around and learn from what is happening uh, outside the, the university. I mean, universities, unfortunately, around the world, and not, it's not at all a critique here, around the world, we have been uh, incentivized and motivated in the wrong way in many cases, right? And there has been a recognition of that. There is an, an increasing recognition that we need to account for the capacity to engage with broader society, impact and all these things, but in many cases are still quite you know, vague ideas and concepts, right? Uh, also consider the fact that we are not always trained or train people to actually engage with these complex problems, which are if I, I'm trained as an economist, but when I did my PhD in Cambridge, I spent four or five years working in the engineering department. Because ultimately, you know, if you want to make a good dish, you have to spend some time in the kitchen, right? You cannot just talk about how beautiful would be that kind of menu or that kind of... So that also capacity to engage with the interdisciplinarity, multidisciplinarity of the problems is absolutely essential because economists, especially economists, we have a big problem, right? We, we tend to do not you know, try to find lots of solutions for also other disciplines, but we are not very keen to engage. And it's great that here actually there is willingness to have this kind of conversation opening up the discussion. So I think academia can do a lot, but we need to think carefully about how do we do it and how we self-reflect on how we've been developing so far. Now, in terms of the small dimension, right, which is behind your, uh, small is partially a self-inflicted kind of uh, mentality or problem, right? I'll give you an example. I was working a few years back in Zanzibar, and we have a similar issues in Mauritius, in Uganda. And you, if you think about public procurement, right? The government buys lots of things. But normally, the procurement is completely decentralized. I've looked at what is happening here. I'm just giving you an example from other places. It might be the case, but the procurement is very decentralized, which means each ministry is find their own way, it's organized. And in a small island, it doesn't make any sense, right? Because if you want to use, going back to the point, public procurement in a strategic way, you need to use it to create sufficient scale demand so that a company or a number of companies can provide a certain type of solution to that, right? Uh, there are a number of areas where, you know, I think business people can better than me articulate, you know, how you make money, so to speak, or you add value. Uh, you know, of course, if we talk about adding value by leveraging as economies of scale in large manufacturing activities, that's very difficult to do it because you need amount of capital, scale, cap supply, that, that's difficult, right? You can have a positive accident like in the case of Korea, you have Intel or another company which comes there and build up capacity and then out of that capacity, lots of small companies comes out, out of that when that company disappears. But normally, if you are in a space where you don't have that kind of luxury, the question is there are lots of other sectors where you can actually increase value even operating a smaller scale. You know, medical device is an interesting thing because, yes, you buy machinery internationally, but, you know, you need to adapt them to the specific context, right? You, you, ca you cannot just plug whatever machinery there. You need to train people. You need to... So you can do lots of... And these are complex machinery that require lots of knowledge that goes into it. So they create lots of spillover learning effect. And if you need to have a 
procurement for the hospitals or for whatever, the pu public sector in that space, and you think, think strategically about it, well, suddenly you can have a few companies, which of course will have initially have to import lots of things, and that goes without saying, that's what I was describing. But they can start engaging with a more complex technology, adapted techno technology to the context, and in doing that, learn. Ultimate industrialization is learning, right? So you need to create opportunity for learning, and some of these opportunities turn out to be more profitable or more, uh, uh, you know, scope for value addition higher than others. I talked about agriculture. I mean, we are seeing a massive revolution in agriculture. I mean, you think about Fondación Chile. I mean, now they are struggling in Chile because they realize that also there are sustainability problems. If you think about the salmon industry, if you think about some of the export, the initial, in, in, uh, the, the early initiatives that were put in place around tweaking few, few varieties, linking up with companies which were operating in Europe or in the US, these were starting at small scale. They were not starting necessarily at large scale. So I would say there are areas which can be uh, uh, exploited uh, and we need to realize that many of these areas, even if we don't call them manufacturing, doesn't matter. We need to move beyond this idea that we have stick in the mind that manufacturing is an old, dirty factory somewhere with lots of big pieces of equipment. That's not what it is. Manufacturing is everything, is the how you do things, right? Agriculture can be manufacturing, services can be manufacturing. So let's focus on the how we produce good things that have a market value that can add, add good jobs and so on, more than you know, creating false uh, separation between sectors or activities and so on. And we try to see how to use Manufacturing processes, organizational capabilities, technologies to increase value and, and, and bettering the outcome of many of these activities. Thank you. I think we have to leave it at Mr. Chair. Uh, we, can we take one more question? Last one. La one last question. I saw that on first year, so. Um, hi. So. I am fully on board with what you're saying about like um, creating these value-added industries and basically building up um, our own manufacturing sector, as it were. Um, but we here in the Caribbean, especially in the Anglophone Caribbean, our fate is kind of linked, as it were. So um, what I was hoping you could address is um, how it is, like just to give advice on how it is that we could perhaps um, create some sort of collaboration and maybe sort of revitalize our um, Caribbean economic community, as it were. Because in a lot of the places that you had mentioned in your examples, like Thailand, for instance, they have the, I believe it's ASEAN, and of course you have the EU and all of that. And those are great environments for that sort of thing to um, bubble up, but I find that here in the Caribbean, we're a little bit more disjointed. So I'd appreciate if you could talk about how it is we could kind of bring together that collaboration again and sort of enhance the economic environment. Thanks, I think, thanks for raising this issue because um, I haven't, uh, partially because there was already a lot of material, I didn't touch upon regional value chains and use a regional market also to address the scale problem that was, was discussed before. Um, Okay, let me practice now the pessimism of the reason and then I'll do the optimism of the will. So the pessimism of the reason is that I've been working in East Africa for 10 years or so, and, the rea and you know, the East African community is the most integrated regional market in the African continent. It's a custom union, like the EU. Um, which means that, for example, things like special economic zone regulations are embedded into the uh, custom protocol, right? Because, of course, if you offer incentive to firms within, like in the European Union, if you are offering certain type of tax deduction, whatever it is, that has to be harmonized across all the countries which are part of that. Now, these things are built up and often, because the countries are all having a similar economic structure, so there is little complementarity in trade, while they're set up, at the same time, governments, each government's lobby to have variation on the regulations, let's say trade, uh, provisions, duty emissions, whatever, to actually protect their own activities, right? And because they more or less do the same, produce the same, they end up basically having very little trade among themselves. So that's the reality of, and of course, 
uh, businesses can leverage uh, a number of, uh, how to say, disalignment in the trade regime and so on to actually benefit from that, right? Not in a necessarily productive way, right? There is lots of smuggling, lots of problems related to how this basically tax regime and so on are used. This is the negative side. The positive side is that there are others where regional value chains are already emerging by themselves because businesses are already trying to benefit from opportunities that exist. And sometimes they cannot do it fully and in a productive way because the regulation is quite unable to basically accommodate the emerging patterns in terms of regional trade, right? So the issue is really looking around at what are the complementarities that exist in trade that actually can allow to build up a more regional value chains type of approach. The study we have just published recently was looking at, again, these are very sector specific issue. I keep emphasizing this issue. You know, we cannot understand regional value chains implication in food in the same way we understand in garment or apparel or whatever other industry. So we need to be serious about going to the nitty gritty. But what we found interesting was that when we look at garments and apparel, for example, in uh, Kenya and Tanzania, and we're looking at how they were losing the regional markets for upgrading in the value chain in terms of functional upgrading, what they were, you know, knitting or Katenga products, whatever kind of design and so on. We saw that actually in some cases, the regional markets were playing an important role in terms of giving companies an opportunity to uh, start on the side of their main activities, start creating lines of products which were more innovative. So for example, both Kenya and Tanzania, in particular Tanzania, which is also part of SADC, export lots of things to the South African market because there is a market for specific kind of design and, and kind of things, right? So sometimes international markets are very important when you want to build up scale because if you want to develop garments industry and you are under a Goa, you want to actually have a big buyer in the US, in the UK, wherever it is. But in these areas, not necessarily you are going to uh, have lots of innovative products. You are just going to have what the big companies asking you to produce with very specific requirements. You just work on learning the manufacturing process there, right? And it's very important because you create a, a, an entire task force of people who now know how to work within a factory, right? So it has lots of learning effect, but not necessarily in terms of developing innovation or technologies engaging with more complex issues. So regional market sometimes can be a learning ground for that kind of process. So you can start thinking about, are there experiences here where these learning grounds are emerging, right? And how the regional trade agreements can actually facilitate that kind of complementarity in trade to emerge. 